and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in true crime talk radio. This is True Crime Tuesday. I'm your host, Dave Schrader, and tonight we have an interesting show for you. Now, this is actually the 26th anniversary of the murder of a very good friend of mine, and it was at the hands of her former boyfriend. She was murdered. Two of her children were murdered. Her unborn child cut out of her womb. These three people that were involved in the murder are currently sitting in prison in Illinois, have been for 26 years. My friend Deborah Evans lost her life along with her son, Joshua Ryan Evans and Samantha Evans. That's something that haunts me to this day. As a friend, I saw some of the signs, I saw the abuse, I saw things, and I didn't know what to do. I felt powerless to actually help her and wasn't sure what I could do to help anyway. I certainly wasn't in a position in my life where I could have her come live with me in Minnesota. Things turned out poorly. Many of us have been touched in life by domestic abuse death at the hands of people that are supposed to love one another. And that's brutal. Not at any kind of death is easier to deal with, but at the hands of someone who loves you or reports to love you, violence like that is unacceptable. And it stems far beyond just the physicality of abuse. There's mental abuse and verbal abuse, physical abuse. In this world that we live in right now, there are things popping up constantly. There are hand signs. They've taught on TikTok. I'm not sure if you've seen this, but there are hand signs that you can make when you're doing a social media video to alert the viewer that you're in a bad position and that you need help. We're in that kind of world now, and not many people know that. We've heard some amazing stories over the years of people calling around and Uh, ordering pizza while at the hand of their captors or texting in the order and in the note, putting help, I'm being held captive, different things like that. And, you know, people are reaching out in new ways, but for a lot of people that are close, sometimes they don't even see this or they believe their friend because their friend is too smart to be stuck in a bad relationship. And it's never a sign of intelligence to be involved in a relationship that's destructive. It's empathy and compassion. It's the want and desire to help somebody that you love and believe that you are the person that can help put them on the right path. And as we know, especially with the news of Gabby Petito, Petino, it, it doesn't happen that way often. And there are more tragedies than there are good stories, it seems. And there aren't many resources that women can utilize to get out of this. So. This is also the month of the White Ribbon Day, which is November 25th. Tonight's show was supposed to be a follow-up about my friend's murder. Being a fair and just show, I was contacted by the daughter of one of the murderers, who claims that there is another side of this story, one that has been hidden, and she has a reporter who is willing to come on. And Sadly, at the last minute, the reporter was called away to cover another story and could not record the show today. And because I believe that the reporter is instrumental in helping to lend credence to the story that we're about to hear from the daughter of one of the killers, I felt it was a disservice to her to just have her on on her own without any formal support from somebody who's actually researched and studied and looked into this case. So we will be doing that episode here in the next few weeks because that is an important story and I have had my mind blown by some of the information that came out. But that left a chasm for today of what to discuss. Who do I get in as a guest at the last minute? And it hit me. I have somebody very close to me that could talk about abuse in a relationship, a survivor that made it out. And I asked her if she would be willing to join me tonight, uh, last minute, to do this episode. And she agreed to do so. This will be the most 
intensive conversation that we've ever truly shared about this topic. And although she has joined a few friends' podcasts to pop on for 10 to 15 minutes to discuss this at the time of Gabby Patino's death, she has not gone fully in depth into her story. When we're on the outside looking in, we wonder, how do they not see these signs? Why don't they just leave? Why are they staying? And we want to make sense of it, and it's, it's extremely hard to do so. As I was starting to say, White Ribbon Day is November 25th. That's the international day when people wear a white ribbon to show that they do not condone violence towards women. It was started by a men's movement in Canada in 1991 and has been officially adopted by the United States, uh, the United Nations, as its International Day for Elimination of Violence Against Women. And I thought, why not talk about that now, raise that awareness before November 25th? Tonight, we're going to talk with my wife, Winnie Schrader. We're going to talk with her about her very brutal experience and situation. And this is a woman that I find very intelligent. She is one of the strongest people I know and has survived many different things. But I have questions. How does one find themselves in these situations? And once it gets bad, why don't you just leave? Why don't you tell somebody? We'll find out more about that as we begin our program. A little bit later, for those of you that are full subscribers to the premium channel, you will get dumb crimes, stupid criminals, and to lighten things up, Winnie's going to stay on and have some laughs with me about some of the dumb crimes and uh, talk about that. But ladies and gentlemen, welcome to True Crime Tuesday, my wife, Winnie Schrader. Hello. Well, thanks uh, for doing this again, short notice and exposing part of your story to this broad audience. But I think that this is important because as I found through doing darkness radio over the years, by being open about my anxiety, my depression, uh, you know, issues that I've faced, it's helped others realize they're not alone and that they could survive if I survived. And I appreciate you being willing to do this and be the voice for a lot of people who can't speak for themselves. So thank you for doing this tonight. Oh, you're welcome. That That's the whole point of me telling my story is to help those who don't have a voice or are too scared to speak out. Now, I want to make sure that we say this up front. This is not your ex-husband. This is not the man uh, that you were married to before me. No. Um, so I want that to be clear and free. Uh, you know, your, your ex-husband and you have a very good relationship and uh, have three lovely children that you share and work well together to co-parent and do that. And he was actually instrumental in helping you um, in your situation. So we're going to, we're going to talk about that a little later, but because there were never any criminal charges pressed against this person, and I don't even want to refer to him as a man, uh, we are going to change his name mm -hmm. in order to protect you, uh, protect liability issues and, and such. That is not to say that we believe that in any way, shape or fact that you are lying about what you're about to share with us, but it's not a storm that needs to be rained down on us at this mm -hmm. point. So talk to me about how old you were when you met Sam. And that's the name that we're going to associate with this man. Well, I met Sam in high school when I was a freshman. Um, so I was like 14, 15 years old. Um, we just struck a friendship up uh, for a couple of years. And we started dating when I hit the age of 16. And how old was Sam at that point? He was 19. Now, in this gap of friendship, how long did you say it was before you started acting like a couple, dating, and, and really taking it to the next level? It was probably, uh, it was the fall that I turned 16. So it was shortly after I turned 16 that, I'm trying to remember the years, it's been so long. Um, but yeah, I was uh, going into my junior year in high school. And um, I just started, and we just started dating right probably October of that year. And it just kind of developed from a friendship into a relationship because he had broken up with his girlfriend. And now was this that, girlfriend, was this somebody that you knew and also went to school with? Yes. And at this point, were you aware that there had been any problems with him in past relationships? 
Yes. Oh, so you were aware of that going into this relationship with him? Vaguely. It, it was very vague. Um, you know, there was some reports of her being abused, but it was always this other guy. It wasn't Sam. So it was kind of a red flag that I was like, I don't know, because I was hearing so many different things throughout our groups of friends of what was actually going on. So I couldn't really grasp the truth because there were so many different stories going around. So and and she wouldn't talk about it at all. So so her not speaking about it, her her, her option to remain silent. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that that empowered you that, well, if this really was happening, of course, she would talk about it? Yes, yes. I mean, I. You know, at that point in, in my life, I'd have been like, well, she would have said something if, if he was hurting her physically. You know, mm -hmm. um, I had never been around abuse before like that. So I didn't know the complex issues that people have in those type of relationships. So I just assumed that it was the other guy that she was kind of seeing on the side. And that's what everybody believed from then on. Now, when you were friends with Sam. Did he ever show any flashes or indications of a temper? Yes, he did. Um, the one time that I noticed his temper got really heated was when we went to the Sadie Hawkins dance together and his ex-girlfriend was there with her current boyfriend. And that really made him mad to the point where we were in his vehicle and we were chasing them in their car, you know, throughout our hometown because he was so angry about it. And I just kept saying, well, you're not with her anymore. I don't understand why you're so angry. And he just wasn't listening to anybody. And eventually we talked him down and we went back to a friend's house for an after party for, from the dance. But that was probably the only thing prior to me dating that I saw a lot of a temper or any type of aggression. All right. Now, again, 2020, hindsight is uh you know exactly that it's it's easy to see these problems in reverse mm -hmm. but this man while you're dating him chases down an ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend mm -hmm. and is unwilling and unmovable to come down for quite a while and it, it's not just you it's everybody that's trying to bring him out of this mm -hmm. why I, explain for for listeners and experiencers around the world and for women or girls who have not had a relationship like this, why was that not a major glare? I mean, to at me right now, it sounds like a, a blowhorn signal of epic proportions. Oh, this guy's a nut. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, I was young. I mean, the, you know, I, you know, I was only 16 at the time. I didn't know the complexities of a relationship. And I kind of felt bad for him because of the other things, you know, there was a lot of name calling rumors going around a lot of back and forth between all of our groups of friends. And, you know, they were kind of saying stuff behind his back. And I, I had the impression at the time that that's why he was so angry because her current boyfriend was bad mouthing him to all of our friends. And, um, so that's, I had empathy for him. I kind of felt bad for him. Like, you know, he's, cause he was always nice to me and he was sweet to me. So I was like, he's a nice guy. He's funny. He's sweet. I don't see why, you know, they're talking, you know, so much crap about him. That's not even true. So, you know, that's where that empathy came in. I feel sorry for him. And, you know, and it just kind of made me look at him in a different way that I kind of, cared about him like i acknowledge that i can i really care about this person and i feel bad for them so you know and that's kind of what kicked off our relationship right at that sadie hawkins dance i mean we took it to the next level to where we were actually boyfriend girlfriend after that dance and you know i look back at it now that was a huge red flag but i right. was so blinded by immaturity being 16 years old that I didn't see that. I, and I want, I want listeners, uh, men and women alike to stop and think about that because I know I can hear the sound of eyes rolling. Mm -hmm. Well, she's obviously just an idiot. She's stupid. How could she, that compounds the problem for women in these situations and makes it why women are afraid because they find themselves in the sand trap 
and not realizing it because of emotional immaturity or uh, empathy and, and reasons that they don't want to make themselves look like fools or idiots. So I want you to take a deep breath, folks, and realize we're talking about a 16-year-old girl, 16-year-old girl who hadn't had a lot of relationships at this point. And obviously, as teenagers, especially, we're driven by hormones, we're driven by lust, we're driven by that those first, you know, kind of exciting chemistry reactions that we have with people. And that was very much in order for you. Mm -hmm. It was. And you, you decide, okay, after that Sadie Hawkins dance, after this, you know, well, obviously she upset him. She must have really hurt him. I'll ne I would never do that. We'll never have a problem. Is that kind of the concept you're going into? Yes. Like, you know, it's like, I can treat you better. I can love you the way you deserve. You know, those kinds of things were going through my mind because I really cared about him, not only as, you know, coming a couple, but he was a friend of mine for a couple of years prior. So it's not like I didn't know him from Adam and he just came to my life and, you know, all this stuff was happening, mm -hmm. you know, so I had that, you know, that pre-relationship relationship with him. And um, it just it felt like things, the pegs weren't fitting into the square holes. Right. And, mm -hmm. you know, when we started dating, you know, things were great, you know, and he seemed a lot happier not being with his ex and not dealing with that. And then he focused it all on me. And was this that quintessential trying to sweep you off your feet, uh, complete and utter focus and love given to you and, you know, trying to win you over, trying to woo you and, and just, you know, and I bring that up because that seems to be a hallmark of mm -hmm. a lot of abusive people. And I don't want to say that that's the way for everybody. There are a lot of good people that are in relationships that uh, started very affectionate, loving and passionate and have stayed that way. It doesn't mean that they're all negative. So I don't want people to start looking, Oh my God, this guy's nice to me. He must be a psycho. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want to build that fear in either, but I want people to know that, you know, we do have to uh, examine different elements of the story that way. Um, but was he very, would you say, almost now overly attentive? Yes. I mean, like in the beginning, he was he would constantly call me. Um, he'd always want to hang out. Um, he would take me to restaurants. He would buy me flowers. Um, he would pick me up from school, you know, things like that. I mean, he was very sweet and nice and really, you know, sugarcoated everything when it came to him and I in the beginning of our relationship had you met his family and what was that interaction like? Yes, I did meet his family. I actually met his family before we started dating, but mm -hmm. um, I went over to his house quite a bit uh, when we started dating and I got to know his family very well. Um, you know, the only person I really didn't see much of was his father, but um, I actually had a great relationship with his mother and his aunt. And, you know, I actually felt more comfortable, you know, further into the relationship being around them than him. Um, but, yeah, they were they were wonderful people. And, um, you know, and he seemed to be great with them at first. And so he was he was polite and kind to the women in his mm -hmm. life, at least at first in front. Yes. Of him. Mm -hmm. And his father. Would his father, when you would see him, would he show signs of this? Was it a learned behavior, do you feel? or I do feel it was a learned behavior. His father was a severe alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And his both his uh, mom and dad lived in the same home, but his father lived in the basement and not with his mom in the bedroom. And he didn't interact with the family much at all. Mm -hmm. He just had like his own little dwelling downstairs and he the only time we really saw him is when he'd kind of come upstairs to go to work and or when he would come home from work or from the bar so you see this but again being 16 mm -hmm. the scope of your vision is really just focused on you and your boyfriend and not the dynamics and interworkings of their family yeah yeah it was just right. you know i just thought oh okay well i guess his father does you know, he's a drunk and he just lives downstairs. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. like um, there was much interaction at all between any of even my boyfriend, Sam, and his dad. I didn't see much interaction between those two either. 
Now, how long into dating him after making that commitment on Sadie Hawkins dance uh, to become his girlfriend before real flashes of his anger and who he was began to show themselves? It was probably that following spring Mm -hmm. and uh, the first time. So five, six months, maybe? Yeah. Yeah. Because October. Yeah. So it was about like May of the following year. Mm -hmm. Um, We went fishing together and because that was one thing we liked to do. And we were fishing and I was getting my stuff together and I had already got my um, uh, line in the water and he was still fumbling around with his stuff. And I asked him, I said, do you need help? And he just immediately snapped at me and told me to shut the F up. I'm trying to do something here. And it was just that real angry, just, you know, it was very unexpected. And I just, my mouth just dropped and I just kind of glared at him. And I'm like, where did this come from? What happened? I All I asked was a question to help you, you know, and it was just very uncalled for. And I didn't understand why. And he was just kind of quiet for the rest of the time we were fishing. And, you know, that night I went home, he went home and that was that. And then... How was he after that? I mean, once he settled in, you get into fishing, does does things just revert back to normal? No, things were very tense. I mean, he didn't talk much at all while we were fishing. I didn't talk to him. And then uh, we just went home. And about a week later, that's when things started amping up. Now, it takes a week before things start getting worse. What is your thinking during all of this? Are you wondering, did I do something wrong? Did, or are you thinking, oh, he must be going through a lot of stress at home? What, where is your mindset? Well, of course, you know, your natural thought is like, what did I do wrong? You know, let me know so I can fix it. And I thought, well, maybe he's just having a bad day, you know, because we all have those days where we're just like, don't talk to me. <laughs> but um, yeah, and it's just, I, he never really pinpointed, you know, he just said, just leave me alone, leave me alone. Cause I kept asking him what's wrong. Just leave me alone. I'm like, okay, I'll just leave you alone. You can come to me and talk to me when you're ready. And he never did. So I honestly, from that, that point, I don't know what happened. What is the next interaction that you do have with him? Uh, the following week, um, it was towards the end of the school and, a bunch of our friends, we all got in a vehicle. We ended up at another friend's house. And uh, I stood outside the whole time we were outside. It was during our lunch break at school. And then we had to get back to school. And uh, when I saw him after school later that evening, he started berating me about going over there. I'm like, well, I don't know what the problem is. It, he's a friend to both of us. I don't understand why you're getting mad. And that's when the first physical reaction uh, he did on me. And then he was accusing me of cheating on him and doing all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know how I cheated on you. I stood out by the curb in the yard the whole time. Um, But yeah. And then that's when he got first physical with me by grabbing me by my throat and holding me up against a wall. All right. Again, a major reaction yes. to what you feel is a very minimal issue. Mm-hmm. What do you do to start to process that? He's now laid hands on you. It's gone from just, you know, fuck you to a physical altercation. I honestly, I don't know what, what I was thinking at the time. I was terrified. I just, I, I, never have had anybody grab me by my throat. And when somebody does that to you, your immediate reaction is I'm going to die because that's your air supply. That's like where, you know, you see in the movies, everybody kills each other by choking them out and stuff like that. And it's just, that's what was going through my mind. I had, I couldn't process anything with him. It was all about, uh, uh, fright or flight in my mind. And, um, once he finally let go and I, I fell to the floor and I was just, I just started sobbing. And then of course he started sobbing and started apologizing and things like that. And, um, I just said, okay, just please don't do that again. 
And so is it because in the moment he showed remorse and compassion after mm -hmm. the fact, do you think it was because it was such a quick, like, oh my God, what have I done? And an apology that that's what made you more willing to forgive? Yes. Cause I mean, his, his reaction, I mean, he, he started sobbing and he was like, it was almost like he was shocked of his own behavior. Like, I can't believe I just did that. And, you know, he felt like he had a lot of sincere remorse. And, you know, I just told him, I'm like, don't ever do that again. And he's like, I promise I won't. I will never hurt you again. And I said, okay. And things were okay for about a month. And then it started reverting back. And this, you know, this momentary lapse, this month of, of kind of, back to normal are you seeing any now looking at it again looking back at it are you seeing any little flashes or was it really just that good and quiet for you know approximately 30 days um well when i look back at it every time we had an incident like that especially in the beginning when things started getting physical he would almost act overly sweet and overly loving like he was just trying to pour it on me for me to forget about what happened if that makes sense. Um, like he would just constantly, it was almost like he was baby talking me like, Oh, hi, honey. Oh, how is your, you know, it was just didn't feel very sincere. It just felt, you know, it just kind of felt a little icky to me, but I got used to it. You know, I just like, okay, well, I guess if this is how he has to be, to be nice to me, then I guess I'll accept it, you know, cause he's not hitting me. He's not yelling at me. So I guess this is how it's going to be. Now, would you, looking at it again at this point, would you say that the feelings that you had for him were deepening, the love was deepening for him, or was it more a sense of comfort? I know this person, I have a history with this person, I'll just see it through. I would say it was more of a comfort thing, you know, because I would you know, when you're a teenager, you're automatically almost insecure right off the get go. So, you know, th being a teenager and having the insecurities of that and, you know, the pressures of having a boyfriend and things like that, I was just like, OK, I'm comfortable with him. I know him. You know, I think I'll just stick this through. And plus, you know, I also had that empathy for him and I wanted to help him and love him and, you know because of his previous relationships from what he told me that he was, you know, cheated on and mistreated and stuff. And I promised him I would never do that to him. So I, I'm a very loyal person. And when I make a promise or a vow to somebody, I stick to it. And I didn't want to give up on him because I felt like I'd fail myself if I did. When he would do this and flash and, overreact get violent mm -hmm. was it an apology of oh, i'm sorry this is all on me or was it a look what you made me do at first it was he felt it was all on him uh you know when the phys uh, physical abuse started happening but as it gradually got worse the verbal abuse got worse and then it got to the point where he was just hateful all the time. And then it got to the point where he would blame me for his actions. I caused him to hit me. I caused him to yell at me for something that I did. So even though I didn't do it, he, it was like he was creating problems in order to lash out in anger. It's weird, right? Because I mean, if in all honesty, mm -hmm. we've all done that. We've all lashed out and maybe, you know, you know, said something, uh, acted, you know, a certain way, but it takes a whole different level to then put hands on people. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, if that's what resonates with people is it's like, but I've done that and I wasn't abusive. Mm -hmm. So maybe she's just overreacting. Maybe she's just misinterpreting. And I'm not talking about the physicality that it's pretty hard to misunderstand, yeah. But I, 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 do you know where I'm going with that? I mean, it's more in the mm -hmm. fact of I'm trying to understand this as well, as I'm sure many of the listeners are trying to wrap our heads around what is the logic? Maybe that's the problem. We're looking for logic. We're looking for places where logic doesn't 
compete. It's, you know, affairs of the heart, the heart and the brain often do not speak the same binary language. Mm -hmm. And even with the paranormal, right? Our brain wants to dismiss what we've seen and experienced and rationalize it and try to make sense of it. And we do that in relationships. And, you know, you sit there and, you know, even you and I, there's been moments when we've gotten angry or we've lashed out verbally, knowing that it's not the other person's fault. Mm -hmm. But, you know, do people see that? Do people witness that in their everyday life to the point where then it's like, oh, well, you know, then that's normal. Winnie, that's normal that, that he would do that. Everybody gets mad and, and flares from time to time and says things. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to, again, just trying to understand, do you think that is a, a portion of why people are so uh, clueless to the signs of this because they logically want to make sense of it. They want to rationalize, you know, well, I've had those moments. Does that mean I'm somebody, well, I'm not abusive. I know I'm not abusive. Yeah, I mean, I think so, because, you know, in my relationship with him, when he would have those moments, you know, I know what happened to him earlier that day, and it could have been something bad. So maybe that's why he's angry. Um, How can I fix it for him? That's like the number one thing. What can I do to make him feel better? And you get to the point where, I mean, it's a form of mind control. And you get to the point where all you're doing is making them happy and trying to fix their problems that you completely wipe out your own self health, your own self well being. And, you know, it's a very unselfish thing to do. But then again, it hurts yourself in the long run. I mean, I gave everything to him. And, you know, he just, you know, stomped on it like it was nothing. And, you know, I just, I don't understand the logic either, because I think when somebody is constantly putting you down and, and wearing you down to the point where you can't even think straight anymore. So you don't even know what logic is. Okay. He's having a bad day. It must and then you get to the point where you think he's having a bad day. Cause it's my fault. I did something to cause him to be angry, even though I know I didn't. Something I did set him off. And, you know, you start believing that because he tells you that over and over and over again. And you have no self-love at all anymore. Your self-esteem is completely gone and you're devoted to him only. And that's what happened to me. And I never thought that I would get to that point in my life. I never thought I would get in a relationship like that in my life. Did you but did I you did. have friends that were in abusive relationships that you had seen this play out before? Not at the time. I found out many years later. I I did have a couple friends that were in abusive relationships, but they didn't tell me till after we had graduated high school and I was no longer with with Sam anymore and we were talking and they came out to me saying that I was in an abusive relationship with so-and-so. And I'm like, wow, I had no clue. I had no clue, but I'm glad you told me. And I would tell my story to them so that way they didn't was feel it, alone. Was it surprising to you that these were people you knew as well and you were in the midst of a bad relationship and yet you couldn't even see when they were in it? Yes, I was shocked. I, I had no clue. And they didn't even have a clue that I was in a relationship that was abusive either. And because I don't know, it's not like we try and hide it, but we're very ashamed of it. And we would try and hide it because of the shame. So well, it was like. And, and the fact, if I understand this correctly, that um, he came between you and friends. Mm-hmm. He, he se- separated you from people that might know or see you not acting normal. Mm hmm. Is that, is that fair to say? Yes. And you know, what he would do is he would be a complete, I mean, jerk to my friends. And then he would say, I don't like that friend. I don't want you hanging out with them anymore. And then he would monopolize my time. So I didn't have time to hang out with my friends at all. So it got to the point where it was just him and I. Does it start making sense almost to you? Like, 
yeah, maybe maybe that friend is is a jerk. Maybe that person is is bad. Maybe I should avoid that. Or how do you compensate for that change? These are people that you know, love, and and were friends with. Well, I, I didn't think that they. I, I even told them, I'm like, they're not like that. Well, you know, and then of course it would cause an argument between us. I said, look, fine. I won't hang out with them anymore. If it's going to make you happy, I won't hang out with them because I didn't, from my perspective, I didn't want to force people to be around him and have force him to be around people and have that tension and issues causing between friendships and my relationship with Sam. So I just, I put my foot down with it and I just said, fine, I won't see this person anymore. Are you happy now? That's basically what happened. Because I didn't believe what he was saying. I knew he was just saying it because, you know, it kind of started triggering in my mind. I'm like, you know, I think he just doesn't want me to have friends, you know. But I didn't want to put anybody, especially my friends, in any type of uncomfortable situation around him. Because I wasn't sure how he was going to act towards them or hit them. So no. you you had a concern that he was going to lash out because he wasn't being friendly with them. It wasn't like he was a sweetheart to everybody else and secretly abusing you behind the scenes. He was he was a dick to everybody. Yep. When it, as our relationship progressed and the abuse got worse, yes, he was becoming. I mean, he was just an ass to everybody. I mean, and you know, I didn't want that. I didn't want to subject that to my friends. Mm -hmm. What but were I your was, friends saying about that? Were they seeing it and warning you? Um, a little bit. They didn't know that there was physical abuse, but they're like, dude, he's a jerk. You just need to break up with him. You know, that kind of thing. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I love him. And that, you know, the same old story that you hear all the time. And I just couldn't get myself to leave him because I felt, I felt like I couldn't do any better. My self-esteem was gone. I was depressed why? Why? I mean, for people that don't know you, and I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not just saying this because I'm your husband. You're, yeah. you're an absolutely stunning woman. You're intelligent. You're funny. You, um, you know, you're, you're not a mousy personality. Why would you start questioning your self-worth? I mean, you were a, a competitive athlete as well. You knew what you were capable of. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly, I don't know. I, when I looked, I remember, I remember one day I looked in the mirror and I did not recognize my reflection. I'm like, this isn't me. I don't know what's going on with me, but this isn't me. You know, I know I'm pretty. I know I'm a sweetheart. I know I'm a nice person. I wear my heart on my sleeve. And, but when, when you have somebody that you care about and love constantly berate you and put you down. And call you names and tell you you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong. You just start to believe it because you're like, well, this person says they love me and this is what he says to me. So it must be true. He maybe he's trying to give me tough love. I don't know. But then, it, you know, it just it kind of just gets ingrained into you and you just start losing your, you know, yourself and you become this completely other person that you don't even recognize anymore. All right, folks, it gets worse. There's a lot more to this story. Look what you made me do, a survivor story. My guest today, Winifred Schrader. All right, getting into the concept of what you were dealing with and the, just how bad it was starting to go. Mm -hmm. you've, you've talked about him putting his hands around your throat, a couple of shoves here and there. When does it start escalating to the point where this is really kind of getting dangerous. Like your life is, is possibly in danger and, and he might end you. Well, I think the first point in our relationship where I really felt terrified for my own life. And it was kind of this, um, kind of this progression that happened, but, when I hit 17 years old, I got pregnant and he immediately wanted me to get an abortion. And from, you know, it's not that I'm for or against abortion, but for me, I felt very guilty to do something like that. And, um, 
he just, he wasn't going to, he's like, well, I'm not, I don't want you to have this child and I want you to get an abortion. You're going to get an abortion. I'm like, well, I don't know. Let me think about it. And for the couple days, he just kept pressuring me, kept pressuring me. And I went over there one day and he threw me down on the bed and he pinned me down and he's like, look, how about we just save some money and I'll just beat it out of you. And he was ready to start pounding on my stomach to give me a miscarriage. So this wasn't him with a bad sense of humor, making a, a poorly timed joke. This was his legitimate thought. Hmm. Well, maybe I'll just beat the baby out of you. Yep. He wanted to do that to save money because it was getting close to Christmas time and he wanted money for gifts. And, you know, I said, look, I said, fine, fine, fine. I, I'll go get an abortion. I want to do this medically. I want to do this right. I don't want it beaten out of me. I said, if you have a problem, I'll pay for it. I'll find a way to pay for it. And uh, he's like, okay. And we ended up making the appointment. And uh, I just remember sitting in the waiting room and feeling awful. And he was being a jerk. I just remember how much of a jerk he was because he was going to go Christmas shopping with his buddy and this was taking too long. And so they brought me in back and I remember the questions they were asking me, you know, and the one that stood out is like, are you being forced to have this abortion? And I wanted to scream to them. Yes, you need to help me. But I couldn't get it out of my mouth. I just couldn't. And he wasn't even in the room with me. That's how much of a hold he had on me. Because at this point in our relationship, I'm to the point where I'm terrified to leave him. I'm terrified to tell anybody because he has threatened to kill me if I did. And, you know, I, I'm, like I said, I'm young. I'm 17 at this time. I don't know what rights I have. I don't know what to do. Nobody in my family knows what I'm going through. They didn't even know I was pregnant. And I just felt very alone. And I had the abortion. And I remember one of the things that, I mean, and this is kind of the, the verbal abuse that he would do and, and just play mind games with me. He got in the car and as we were driving home, he looked, he looked over at me and I says, huh, I wonder if this was the little girl I want, have always wanted in my life. Cause he has always wanted girls for, or daughters when he uh, got older. And I, God, I just you talk looked, about terrifying. I know. Imagine right. Him as a father <laughs> of girls. And I looked at him, I just glared at him and I just, I couldn't even say anything to him. I was so disgusted by him because I'm like, how dare you say something like that to me after what I just went through? How dare you? And this wasn't my choice. This was your choice. But you put me in a position where I was terrified to choose my own choice. I had to choose yours. Now, I want to reel you back there for a second, because I know mm -hmm. that we've spoken about this, this aspect of your story before between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I, I want you, uh, how do I say this? Because I, I don't want to seem like I'm forcing you either, but maybe I misunderstood in, in the past interpretations of this. Um, mm -hmm. But was part of the decision on ending the abortion or ending the, the baby's uh, term, not just because he was threatening you, but because you had fear of what he might do to the baby if he was capable of doing this to you, if if the baby was born? Yes, that was my only, I guess you could say saving grace, you know, because he was forcing me and, and just his actions towards me being pregnant really stuck in my mind. And I'm like, you know, because I, I didn't know what my rights were. If I would have had this child, would he be able to have visitation? Would he be able to take this child away from me? I didn't know. I didn't know anybody who was pregnant and had to go through what I was going through. So I was clueless. And I, and I remember being at the abortion clinic in the waiting room while he was on the phone constantly with his buddy. And the process in my mind was, I don't want to do this, but I feel like I have to for the sake of my child if that makes sense, because I did not want to bring a child into this world and put it in a situation where they're going to grow up in an abusive situation. 
And I, you know, well, I, get- I wanted, I wanted to bring that aspect up um, mm-hmm. just because I know there are going to be people that are villainizing just because of the word abortion. Mm-hmm. And this was a woman who was fearing for her own life. She was fearing for her child's life and realized that if she brought a baby into this world, there was a good chance he was going to take it out of this world if Mm -hmm. he didn't like how things went or to lash out at her, to control her. He was already threatening to beat the baby out of her for health reasons. She needed to go get this taken care of and do it the proper way because leaving it to his devices could have left her crippled or dead. Mm -hmm. So I I want people to think about that, that it's not an easy choice to make, that this is not just a teenager. Oh, we screwed up. Well, let's go get an abortion and we can start all over. There was a lot of thought and process put behind this. I've seen the tortured look in your eyes as you've discussed this with me, Uh, the, the remorse and guilt, but the sense of knowing that had this baby been born into this world with this man as its father, there was a good chance it would not have made it uh, out of infancy. Exactly. That was my, my very thought. And I'm like, how could I live with myself knowing I brought a child into this world, knowing the situation I was going to be in and have something happen to that child. Cause then I, I know myself and I would take on all that guilt because I didn't do something. And I, I, I couldn't live with myself with that at all. And because um, I had things going in my mind, you, you know, shaken baby syndrome. I could I was picturing him in, in my mind doing that to a baby. And I just, it, I was terrified. So I felt like my only option was to abort the pregnancy. I felt that was the safest thing I could do in the situation that I was in. I still feel guilt. I still feel remorse about it because, you know, I, having an abortion is not an easy choice. And it's one I hope I, ne- you know, I, and I'm glad I've never had to make that choice again because I don't know if I could. And um, so, and then after the abortion, things even got progressively worse between us. And I just. Well, now for, for listeners sake and mine. Mm-hmm. Once it's gotten to this point, it seems like there was a golden opportunity to just get the hell out of this relationship to you've now terminated. You no longer have a tie to him forcing you to stay there. Mm -hmm. Why continue at this point? Because um, after the abortion, his controlling uh, issues that he had with me got worse and it got to the point that he said that if I were to leave him, he would kill me and then kill himself. And he would threaten to kill himself all the time. And I just, I didn't know what to do because I felt like if I would leave and if he did kill himself, then his death is on my shoulders. I mean, that's just how I felt at the time. I look back at it now and have been like, well, if he would have done it, that was his choice, not mine. But you know, it just, it just that, that controlling hold he had on me. And it just got to the point where I was so terrified to say something wrong to him, look at him the wrong way. If I were to, you know, be late home and not call him on time, he would berate me. I mean, there were times where I would leave school, I would come home, I would sit down with my grandmother, tell her how my day went, go to the bathroom, then I would call him and he would say, "Why? what took you so long to call me? You should have been home 10 minutes ago. I said, well, I talked to my grandma and I went to the bathroom and then I called you. And he's like, no, uh, who are you screwing behind my back? Uh, nobody, I, I don't know where you're getting this from. And it was just those constant things. And it would just turn into an argument. And if those arguments happened while we were in person and not over the phone, then it got physical, you know, the slapping, the hitting, the pushing, the shoving, the punching, the, you know, grabbing me by my throat. He did that frequently, um, things like that. So it just, why didn't you tell your dad, you, you were a daddy's girl, your father loved you. Uh, and I, I, I say that in the past tense because we lost him a year ago. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not that he stopped loving you, but, you know, I just want a clarification yeah. for the audience. But why not tell daddy? Why not let dad take care of this? Because I was just so ashamed. 
I was so ashamed. I, I wanted to tell my parents so much on what was going on with me. And I just could not get myself to do it because of the, the terror, being in terror, living in terror, I guess you could say. I was constantly living in terror. And I felt like it got to the point where when I'd be at school that he had his friends watching me to make sure I wasn't talking to this person or that person um, because they would report back to him if I did. And I'd show up to his house after school. And first thing I walk in the door was a slap across the face because I talked to so-and-so. You know, it just I I just I, I, I can't even really put it to words. But I just know that that feeling of terror at every turn, everything now, I did. I want to I want to bring up this. This goes both ways. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I'm not standing up for your ex at all. Uh, I'm just talking about the fact that, you know, um, there are men out there who are manipulated by women who threaten mm-hmm. suicide and threatened to hurt themselves or the children in their lives mm-hmm. if they leave. And you wonder, well, why didn't the guy just pick up and leave? Why, you know, why did it turn out this way? Sometimes it's because uh, the men are in that same position. It is not easy either way. There is no easy answer. That's the true horror of all of this is there is no answer that just takes everything and makes it easy. Um, Lives are at stake your family's at stake. And if you're, you know, concerned that if this guy's nuts enough to do what he's doing, will he hurt my family? Will he hurt other people? And that is a real concern. Um, I want to talk a little bit of, in a few minutes about what, what suggestions do you make? Because this is, it's the 21st century, 2021. And I don't know that there is really much safer environment for women now than there's ever been. I, I God, I'd like to think it's true, but I hear about horrible abuse and murder and, and tragedy constantly taking place. So I want to kind of get your take on it. And if you have a different perspective than my bleak cynicism, uh, I want to, I want to dive into that. But one of the things that stood out to you from Gabby Patino's story was the fact that um, he dragged her back into the car Mm -hmm. in one of the claims. I don't know if you want to reframe that and maybe tell that story of, of what happened to Gabby and how that resonated with you. Uh, Well, there was reports. I think they were at a restaurant and some, uh, another gentleman, he was the one that called 911 and he was explaining like he was on the phone with 911 when uh, this was all going on and they were out in their vehicle. And I guess Gabby was standing outside the driver door and he and uh he was in the driver's seat and he pulled her through the window and that happened to me um and that's what really resonated with gabby and myself was like oh my gosh i've been through that i know exactly what that's like i know exactly what she's feeling and um what happened to me was it was a it was like January or February. I remember it was really, really cold. And of course being in Minnesota, it's cold. And, um, we were, uh, he started fighting with me about something. I don't even, honestly, I don't even know what it was about, but he was just angry at me for something. And he's just, you know, cussing and swearing at me and yelling at me. Next thing I know, he, he, uh, pulled me through the driver's side window in his van and then tossed me into the passenger seat and took off. And I'm like, where are we going? You know, and I'm crying and I'm upset. And he's like, never mind, just shut up. And he just kept driving. I'm like, where are we going? And we just kept driving and driving to the point where he took me to the Minnesota, Wisconsin border in the middle of nowhere at like 1230 at night in the middle of winter with no coat. And he told me to get out. And I'm like, I'm not going to get out. I'm going to freeze to death out here. And it's like 20 below zero. And he's like, he was trying to get me to get out of the car. He started pushing me and opened the door and tried to shove me out of the car. I, I held on to the seatbelt, anything I could hold on to. And I'm like, I'm not getting out of this car unless you give me a phone. So I can call 911. I'm not getting out of this car. 
And eventually he relented, but I was terrified that he was going to leave me out there in the middle of the nowhere in the middle of the night when it's 20 below out with no jacket. I mean, I don't know what I, I don't think I would have survived if I did. I wouldn't, there was like no towns anywhere close by that I knew of. I didn't know where we were and it was so dark out and I was just terrified. And I actually crawled into the back of his van and rode home in the very back of the van. I did not want to sit next to him. And as soon as we got back to his house, I got out, I got into my car and I went home and I didn't talk to him for about a week. And then he called and then he apologized and things started over again. Started over again. You mean with the violence or you just started the relationship over again? Uh, Well, usually when something big like that happened, that's when he would, pour on the the sweet and the love and all that stuff. And that lasted about a week and a half. And then it just starts reverting back to how it was where he's getting angry all the time. He starts cussing and swearing at me, calling me names, playing mind games with me. And then the physical abuse would start again. And this was like a week and a half after that incident. So now, You and I have spoken about this. I was in a similar situation uh, at one point with a woman who threatened suicide Mm -hmm. and threatened to hurt herself. And, and um, I finally just got to the point where I didn't care anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I would have to just learn to live with the fact that I didn't make her pull the trigger. I couldn't live under that umbrella any longer. I couldn't live under that terror of feeling like, you know, that responsibility was mine to be a burden. And I finally one day just said, if that's what you have to do. And then I hung up the phone and let it be. And in most cases, it is an idle threat. But Mm -hmm. you, you have to come to that point of, but that's not your problem. And, and the, you know, at this point, especially you'd done your part to try to be empathetic and loving. I, I have to guess at some point, wasn't it crossing your head thinking, yeah, go ahead kill yourself because then that's, I don't have to worry anymore. My life's safe if you're dead. Yeah. I mean, I actually told him one day that go ahead and do it. I dare you. You know, I, I just got to the point where I, I just, I was so fed up with it. I'm like, how dare you put this guilt on me? I'm not going to accept this guilt anymore from you. If you kill yourself, that's on you. It's not my fault. You're the one that's saying it. I'm not telling you to do it. So what was, what, what led you to that moment where it was just like, if I die, I die. If, if he kills himself, he kills himself. This is the line. I have to draw it now. It was towards the end of our relationship. Um, I was just getting to the point where I just couldn't take it anymore. And I started not fighting back, but I started standing up for myself. And, and when I did that, it felt good. I'm not going to lie. It felt good. It felt good to stand up for myself and say, Hey, you're not going to talk to me like that anymore. I'm not going to accept this behavior anymore. And if you don't like it, you can leave. That's basically what I told him. And you know, things didn't get better, but at least he knew where my stance was. And, you know, the very um, last physical fight we got into, I, I lashed out. I did. And um, cause I, I remember walking into his house. He was mad at me about something. <laughs> this is the thing. I don't know what half the reasons why we fought because I don't even know what they were about. He would just start yelling at me for something and it would turn into something else. So um, I remember he grabbed me by my throat and picked me up and held me up by my neck on the wall. And I kicked him and he didn't like that. And he, I ran and he grabbed the back of my head and drug me by my hair into his bedroom. And then he picked me up and threw me on the bed. And one thing that he would always do when he would punch or hit, he would always hit me in places that people couldn't see. He would never hit me in my face. Usually he hit me in my face. Once I got a black eye and the other time he hit me in my jaw, but that didn't leave a mark, but it did damage my jaw a bit. Um, 
but he would always punch me and hit me like on my back or in my thighs or in my uh, stomach thing, you know, where clothes would cover up the bruises. And he was punching me. I remember he was punching me in my kidneys really, really hard. And my first instinct was to cover my face. I didn't want him to hit me in the face because he was just going crazy. And he started yelling at me to remove my hands from my face. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to. And he grabbed this um, seven inch long buck knife and he held it to my face. And he says, if you don't move your face, I'm going to cut your hands off. I said, no, you're not. And he grabbed my hands and he held the knife up against my throat. And he was pun still punching me in my side and in my uh, back uh, where my kidneys were. And I just instinctively reached behind me to grab whatever I could find, which happened to be his snowmobiling helmet. I grabbed it and I just swung it around and walloped him up on side of the head. I remember he fell down to the floor. I got up and I ran out of the house and I never went back. And that was the last time I ever had a physical altercation with him. He would come over to my house trying to win me back. And I wouldn't have it. I just, I told him no. And he just would, he was so relentless. I mean, he just would not give up on trying to get me back. And I remember one night we had a party and he was there and he kept wanting to talk to me and this, and I was like, no, I don't want to talk to you. And finally he cornered me. And I just lashed out and I gave him a three hour tongue lashing in front of everybody, all of our friends from high school, all of our friends that were out of high school, everybody heard everything that he did to me and they all glared at him and it looked like they wanted to tear him apart. And I told everybody, don't worry about it. He's, he's done. I'm done. He's done. Let him go on with his life. I'm going on with mine. And I went home. And that was the last time I saw him. At that point, was it the make or break? Was it the, I don't care if I die. I just, this is it. I'm, I'm making my final stand. This isn't going to take place anymore. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be a victim of this man. Yeah. I mean, I, I looked at myself and said, you want to know what? I don't deserve this anymore. I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to fight back. I, I just, I couldn't take it anymore. I, I was in fear of my life and I, and I wanted to keep my life. So I knew I had to fight for it. And, um, you know, leading up to that last incident we have had together, um, you know, I was starting to stand up for myself and realized how good it felt to validate myself and my own well-being. And that's, I think, what gave me the strength to finally fight back and not take it anymore and to get enough guts to leave them. And to know that I'll be okay if I'm not with him. All right. What is the um, rub here? I mean, you, you deal with this. You make this final stand. It's over. Mm -hmm. Was it ever really over? Did you still spend time looking over your shoulder in constant fear? I, I did for a while because, I mean, I lived in the same town that he did. I remember one time I went to our local grocery store. And as I was walking in, I saw him walk in. I immediately went back to my car and I called my dad and I said, dad, can you please come up here? He's here and I don't want to be in the store with him. I'm terrified to be around him. So at what point did you tell your father then about this? It was about, I would say about a year after I broke it off with him. Now I you were, you were, a, a, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to catch you mm -hmm. on this. You were a, a daddy's girl. Yes. Did daddy not notice? And I'm not, I don't mean this to sound judgy. I mm -hmm. hope you understand that. But I, I know this is going to be the thought of, of many of the listeners. Didn't dad notice that his daughter was changing? If you were unrecognizable to yourself, how did your family not pick up on this? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, maybe I'm just a really good actress. <laughs> I don't know. Um. I tried to, I tried to be my normal self as much as possible when I was home around my family, um, especially around my dad, him and I would joke a lot. So usually 
when I would be around my dad, he would immediately start with the jokes and we'd be go right into laughing together. So it wasn't like I'd walk in and look depressed or anything. He'd come down and say a joke and it would make me smile and make me laugh and put me in a better mood. So it kind of like I disassociated myself, my abused self from my home self with my family. I kind of put that behind me. And the only time that that abuse self came out was when I was around Sam. That's when it really would hit me. It's almost like when I was around my family and he wasn't there, it wasn't happening to me. It was like, I kind of just put it out of my mind and just try to enjoy the moment with my family and not think about all the crap that I've been going through and all the abuse and all the depression I would just kind of separate the two. I don't know how I did it. I don't know how they believed that I did it, but I did it. And they had no clue. They had no clue. The only thing that they thought was that I just spent a lot of time with him. And that was it. They had no clue, which I'm shocked because me being a parent now, if I know any slight subtle changes in my child's behavior, I'm immediately on them. Like, what's wrong? Is something going on? Do you want to talk about it? Um, but they just, I don't know if they just didn't notice or I was that good at hiding it. I don't know. And that, that was one question I never asked them when they were alive. And I wish I would have to see, you know, what did I do that hit it so well from you guys noticing that all this stuff was going on with me? Because when I actually told both my parents, about a year after I broke up, they were in complete shock of what I went through. The only thing I didn't really bring up was the abortion part because I knew that would break my father's heart. And I didn't want to do that to him. But my mother knew about it as well. So what what brought you to the point that you wanted to tell them what had happened? Um, I, did, I felt like I needed to, to cleanse myself of it. Because, you know, I'm, even though I was out of the relationship for a year, I'm still holding on to all this stuff I went through. And I still felt very alone and very uh, isolated from it. Like, you know, because maybe I was having, you know, a couple bad months where I was depressed or not a very nice person to be around. And I kind of wanted them to understand why. This is what I've been going through. This is maybe why I'm acting this way. Or maybe I should get some therapy or something. But I felt like I had to come clean to my parents about it. Because I didn't think it was fair, especially if... Because I did go through a rough patch about a about two years after dating him of kind of regulating my own emotions again. Because I was so entwined with his emotions. Like what he was going to go through that day was going to depend on how my day went. But I didn't have that anymore. So I was like... I had to kind of reevaluate my own self and it was a struggle, you know, especially being, I think I was 19 at the time and um, just getting into adulthood and getting done with school. And I'm just like, I don't even know what I want to do with my life because I was so entwined for two years with this guy that I don't even know what I want anymore. So I kind of was struggling a bit after uh, breaking up with him. And I, and I think telling my parents was kind of a, a step to recovery for myself to finally come clean and to get it off my chest. And it really felt good to tell somebody and that I didn't have to hold it inside any longer. What was their initial reaction to it? Did they question? Did they believe you immediately? Uh, they believed me. They, you know, because I'm a very sincere person and, um, and they knew that. Um, and I just, I, I laid it all out for them and they didn't, they just let me talk. They just let me talk and tell them everything. They didn't even ask questions. And once I was finished, they looked at me and they said, we had no clue. And they said, you could have came to us, but I'm glad that you did now. I'm glad that you came to us at all. And to tell us about it. And we love you very much. And they gave me hugs. And, and then of course my dad was like, you know, being a dad and it's like, oh, well, if I ever see him again, you know, but I'm like, dad, don't just don't. Right. And <laughs> I, I want to address that because that's an important element. And I've, I've been mm-hmm. guilty of that myself. I've mm-hmm. joked about it on the show. Joke, not joke that if anybody ever touched or hurt my children, they would never find the body. 
-hmm. And you have to be careful how you state that. Although you want to convey to your child that you will protect them and that Mm -hmm. you will take care of them. Sometimes moms and dads, by telling them, I'll kill them. They'll never see the body again, where we think we're showing a sense of protection. Now our child has to worry about protecting us on top of the rest of the stress they have. They're afraid that if they tell us, we may do something that'll get us put in jail or put Mm -hmm. ourselves in the crosshairs to get hurt. So please be aware of that. You know, let your child know, honey, you never have to hide these things from me. I'll never do anything rash that will harm you, me, or anyone else, but I will be here to protect you. And that I think needs to be the message conveyed to both your sons and daughters Mm -hmm. is that I will be here to protect you, not I will kill someone. I mean, I think everybody knows in the world that we, you know, parents will go to those lengths, but if it's going to frighten our children from telling us, then maybe we start to make that change. And gentlemen, I'm imploring you this month with White Ribbon Day, uh, the change starts with you. Talk to your sons. Talk to your children. Moms, talk to your daughters. Again, abuse does go both ways, although we hear it much more from men to women. It does happen the other way. And we Mm -hmm. need to talk this through with our children. We don't, you know, we teach them how to tie their shoes and how to walk. We teach them how to ride their bike and play catch, but sometimes we forget the most important lessons in life. And when they're old enough to start dating, it's time to set those parameters that listen, if at any time things get to a position that it is uncomfortable for you, or you're Mm -hmm. fearful for your life or your health or my life or my health, you come to me and talk to me about this and we will deal with it in a rational manner and get it taken care of and just uh, approach it. But gentlemen, you have to talk to your children. Ladies, you need to talk to your children and tell them this activity is not acceptable. You do not uh, bemoan women. You do not put them down. They are not lesser than you. They are not, uh, you know, below or beneath you in any way, shape or form. And we need to start that at a very early age, showing love and respect for one another. And it starts with us as parents. So please, please take that into consideration and going forward, do the right thing by your children, give them the best chance at life. So a, they're not an abuser and hopefully they never end up abused, but you have to make those first moves. Parents, you have to be the first to talk to them or grandparents, aunts and uncles, guardians, older sisters and brothers. If your parents are too uptight to talk about it, talk to your brothers and sisters about it. Talk to your nephews and nieces. And it it needs to be done. The conversation needs to happen. Men, we need to stop the abuse on women, all of us. And we need to take a deep breath and think through the things we say. And hell, you know, we're all guilty of lashing out at the people we love most because we have the false sense of security that they will always be there for us. And men, sometimes we are irrational, rude, and cold, and not realizing the impact and depth that we are having on our partners by doing that. So please take the time to show some compassion and love. It's something I'm going to work on even more, and I hope you will join me as well, that we can all be better people to the people that we love, that we can take more time and understand them and listen to them. And when we feel frustrated and angry, talk it through. Don't yell, don't curse, don't belittle, don't bemoan. Just talk it through. Treat the person as you would want to be treated. And that's what we have to ask for. So I'm putting that on you, our listeners. And spread the word. Share this episode, please. For God's sake, share this episode so that you can get some insight into a person that was through this and came out the other end. And I know that there are people listening right now, Winnie, that are going to say, I did stand up and he kicked the shit out of me and, and almost killed me. There is no one answer. That's what makes it so hard. But I wanted people to hear your survivor story Mm -hmm. that, that you can't live under the umbrella of fear and you can't live controlled. And there are resources out there, but I, I asked earlier and I'm curious what your thoughts are now in 2021. Is there enough help out there for women that are in these awkward positions? I don't think so. I mean, they have, they have hotlines that you can call and stuff like that. But um, 
I think we need, I think we need to figure out how we can get more type of shelters out there for women. They do have shelters, but a lot of them are overpacked or they have no availability or they've had to close down because there's not enough funding to keep them open because they rely on donations and stuff from, you know, contributors and probably money from the state. And, you know, I think if, and I, I think if they were more public, not public as in, um, you know, knowing where the locations are of these homes, because they're supposed to keep secret to protect them from their abusers. But a lot like when I was going through what I went through, I had no clue that they had battered women shelters. I had no clue that there was a hotline number to call and say, hey, I'm being abused and I'm scared and I don't know what to do. And that and number is one 800 Seven nine nine seven two three three. That's one eight hundred seven nine nine seven two three three. The National Domestic Violence Hotline. You could also check out www.thehotline.org. That's www.thehotline.org. There will be a link for that on today's program guide, along with the phone number to call. Uh, also, uh, check out these TikTok videos, these hand signs, things that you can do to convey your message and get it out there. People are listening and we're listening. But, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure I put that number out there. So please continue. Yeah. So, I mean, if we can find a way to just make more awareness and to publicly know that in certain areas, you know, like, in Minnesota, there's shelters in these counties. So people know that there's a shelter nearby because some women are like, you know, because when I went through everything, I went through and watched a lot of documentaries on domestic abuse and abused women. And a lot of women had to travel 200 miles just to get to a shelter. And I, and I don't think that's fair because it's like, it's, you know, that's kind of probably, very financially straining on them where, you know, especially when you're in abusive marriage with children, a lot of times the men will control the money or the woman would control the money. So how are you going to get this 200 bucks to travel with gas money to get to where you need to go to be safe? They feel very trapped. And I, I feel like if we open up that chasm, and so when women don't feel so trapped, that it doesn't feel so hard to leave because, you know, financially can they do it, especially if there's children involved. Do, does this shelter have enough room for my children as well? I don't want to leave my kids behind. Um, I think we need to figure out if we can open some more um, facilities versus just homes to women that can go and have a safe place to live, especially with their children until they can get onto their own feet and have that protection of the shelter to know that they're not going to get abused by this person again. Now, statistically, it's sad that the majority of women that go into these shelters and leave, they end up going back to the same abuser. And that's sad. So I think we need to get more education. And I think there needs to be more education for the abuser as well more therapy, anger management, make it more available for them. So there's not that stigma. Um, you know, I believe that abusers can call the, um, national domestic violence hotline and find help for themselves. Say, right. look, I'm out of control. I don't know what to do anymore. I'm, I'm getting way too violent to the point where I feel like I'm going to kill my wife or I'm going to kill my husband. And, I think if they acknowledge it and take those steps to get better as well, that might help decrease the domestic violence. And it's sad because domestic violence is usually rooted around drugs, alcohol, low income, poor, financially strapped families. And that's sad because those are the people that need the financial help to get the help they need. And if they can make it more affordable and more accessible to to families that need it the most, I think it would help a lot of people get out of these abusive situations and to live a fulfilling and happy life. Mm -hmm. And I actually, before coming on uh, your show tonight, I was looking, what is the ratio of teen domestic abuse? And when I found out that I had a lot of friends that were being abused at the same time I was, I was shocked. And I just looked at the most recent one, 
one out of five teenagers will be in some type sexual, physical, or mental abusive uh, relationship with a partner. This is high school kids, one out of five. To me, that is very sad. And it's, you know, kind of shocking that even to this day, one out of five teenagers will be abused by their partner. And that's usually where it starts. And usually those men will grow up and they'll become abusive to their wives or the girls will become abusive to their husbands. And I think maybe we could use some more domestic violence and awareness education in high schools. Amen. Let's so, stop worrying about making scrambled eggs and talk to uh, each other, you know, how to, how to treat one another. Exactly. Health, health class shouldn't just be about, uh, you know, how to put a condom on, but how to take care of yourself and other people. And, exactly. you know, that, that should be it. There are two quotes that I want to end tonight's show with one from a pop TV culture, but it's the, the, it's a playoff of Maya Angelou's uh, famous quote. Don Draper from Mad Men was quoted as saying, people tell you who they are, but we ignore it because we want them to be who we want them to be. Mm-hmm. And that's why a lot of people find themselves in these positions. When they tell you who they are, listen. And that's the quote I'll leave you with from Maya Angelou, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. People know themselves much better than you do. That's why it's important to stop expecting them to be something other than who they are. And when they've shown you who they are and what they're capable of, then please take them at that face value. Please. And protect yourself. Winnie, I want to thank you for coming on and talking about this and being open with uh, listeners. And I hope, I hope that this will bring some peace and help to others knowing that you've survived it. Yeah. And that, that's my intent. I think I, you know, from what I went through, if I can help somebody, just one person say, you know, she's right. I am good enough. I don't need to stay here. I'm, I got to leave. I'm better than this. If that's what it takes then I'm all for it because I don't want other women to have to go through what I went through. If you feel like hurting someone or you're being hurt, 1-800-799-7233. Call and get the help. www.thehotline.org. It's a great resource for abusers and the abused. Get some help. Stop the cycle. And I know there are good people out there. I know that there are people out there that do lash out and do bad things and sincerely regret it. But if you don't nip it in the bud and stop it, it's going to only get worse and someday could lead you to a situation like Gabby Patino or Mark and Debbie Constantino, our friends, uh, or my friend Deborah Evans out of Illinois was murdered 26 years ago today by someone that she thought she knew. So be aware and get that help. 1-800-799-7233. For those of you that are full subscribers, stay tuned. We have Dumb Crimes, Stupid Criminals next. For those of you that are only listening to the free version of this, thank you for tuning in. And we hope that you found some solace in today's program, some answers and some insights as to how this can happen to you. And we hope that it'll help you find a way out of the darkness. Thank you for tuning in and be back again with us next week for a brand new episode of True Crime Tuesday. Mm-hmm.